will show up. So, all right. Welcome everyone to Brain 101. We're really excited to have you here today. Um, we're so lucky to have our founder uh, of Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Alliance, Monica Jones, presenting this um, parent-friendly introduction to the brain. I will say that at one of our conferences in the past, my son, who I think was 12 at the time, came out and said, Monica Jones is awesome after seeing this presentation. Uh, he was blown away by it. And um, I think we're all really lucky to have her expertise. Um, while she's not a neuroscientist, she's clearly taken a deep dive into all things brain related. And I think this will be a great presentation. If you have questions throughout, please put them in the chat. I will be moderating the chat. And um, a reminder that if you come off of mute, your image will appear um, on the recording. Um, take it away, Monica. Great, nice to see everybody. Um, before we start, I'm just a parent like you, and although I have done my best to teach this to myself, please take most of it with a grain of salt and ask your child's doctor for anything if you have questions. The whole reason we're doing this is to provide, provide you with information to kind of form the basis of your decisions to support you when you're there at the doctor's office talking about really complicated topics um, that are frankly really difficult for us to navigate, especially when we're in crisis. My advice to you, parent to parent, advocate to advocate is ask questions when you're in the room with the neurologist or the neurosurgeon. If you don't understand something, ask the question again. And then if you still don't understand something, ask again if you need it. It's really easy for us to be embarrassed when we ask those questions, but the surgeons and the neurologists understand that it takes a very long time to become a neurologist. It takes a much longer time to become a neurosurgeon. They have years of training behind them. And no matter how often I ask them to please keep everything at a plain language level when they speak at our conferences or do webinars, for example, for us, Every single time, especially now that I'm going through all of the videos from our summer conference to put them up on YouTube, every single clinician who spoke used terms that are just way out of the ordinary language that we use. I hope that this brief session gives you just kind of the beginning of a framework for you. As I started going through my slides, I realized I think we need to do a few more of these to give you kind of a, a good basis. Please use the hand function to ask questions if you need to, or stop me if you'd like, and I'm going to do my best to kind of go slowly so that we, we form a really good foundation for you. This is a fascinating video that was uh, done out of UCSF, one of their labs, which shows a model of the brain, and then they use real EEG data. I think they use 64 different nodes to show all of the firing that goes on inside the brain just in, in a typical person over a few minutes. And I think it's really important for us to understand that we're used to kind of seeing this image as the brain. It's very familiar, it has the folds and the grooves, but what's going on inside is really quite complicated. So the light is following the tracks of all these connections we talk about, which is what I'm going to talk about quite a bit. This isn't a person who's having seizures. This is just what the brain is doing when it's thinking. So there's some thinking going on in the back around the occipital lobe, as you can see. And there's a little bit going on in the right, and there's some frontal lobe activity. So as we're going through the presentation today, keep in mind that all of this is working together at the same time, and it's really quite complicated. Monica, sorry to interrupt, but there's some people in the waiting room. Could you let them in, please? I will, if you tell me how to do that. Click on participants at the bottom, and then everyone will pop up, and then there will be an option to just admit all, everyone who's left in the waiting room. I don't see them because I'm not host. Uh, I don't see them either. Okay, there's one person. Okay go. Okay. All right. Brain 101. This is the familiar image that you all have of the brain. Think of it as two main structures. There's your cerebrum, 
And then down here at the bottom, we're not going to talk about it too much today, but that's your cerebellum down at the bottom. It's important to remember that when you're talking to your doctors, especially those of us that have big, massive brain malformations like hemimegalencephaly, for example, which is my son's condition or was his condition, I guess, because sometimes the malformation can extend down to the cerebellum. But one of the reasons my son has such a different outcome than so many kids after hemispherectomy, particularly in his ability to walk well, is because he has a very deformed cerebellum as well as deformed brain on one side. So when you're going through the MRIs with your doctor, make sure you also pay attention to what's happening in the cerebellum. These are your two cerebral hemispheres. So we're not going to say brain sides. We're going to say cerebral. Cerebral is the foldy part and you have two hemispheres in your brain. And someone asked me once, if we take out one hemisphere or one part, will it grow back? Does anybody know the answer to that? Do we know if one side will grow back? Most of you are shaking your head no. Nothing, nothing grows back. Yeah, it does not grow back. The brain does not grow back. So when they remove it, when they remove it, it won't grow back. But I still think that's a valid question because generally it's just not something that we know in everyday life. It's it, We're not neuroscientists, we're not neurologists, we're not neurosurgeons. And it's okay to ask a question like that, even if you feel like you should know the answer to it. If we were to take the brain and unfold it, it would be about the size of a dinner napkin. So all of those folds that you see are your brain and it happens, I think, starting at about the six month of gestation, folding, 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 folding to get all those neurons in the right place and inside the skull. So remember that when we're thinking about the brain, it's got lots of folds in it. And that's to accommodate the fact that it flattened out, it would be like a dinner napkin. If we're starting from the outside in, and this is a super simplified image of the different layers before you get to the brain. You start with the scalp, of course. There's muscle in between the scalp and skull and some other tissue. And then you get to the skull, which I wanna say I believe is about five or six millimeters thick. And I know this because at some point my son had to have his skull thinned in order to attempt to make more room for fluid. Um, but then we start getting to some of these structures that you may hear sometimes in our social media groups or when you're talking to doctors, and that's the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia. The dura, I like to think of it, it's almost like a very, very thin leather casing that your brain is in. It really can't be torn. It can be poked. It can be ripped with an object, but tearing it like you know how you can't tear leather? You can't tear the dura. It's difficult for the surgeons to cut during surgery. So sometimes that takes a while for them to get be, you know, underneath the tissue into the dura, especially for those of us that have kids that have, have had multiple open brain surgeries. I know for my son's third surgery, it took the surgeon, he said, a really a much longer than he thought because the dura had so much scar tissue, it was really hard for him to cut through it. Then you have the arachnoid layer. So think spider web, arachnoid, arachnophobia. This is sort of like a spider webby um, a membrane that has a lot of the arteries and the veins that feed the, the brain. Um, so if you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, for example, it might be something you've heard. Is the um, bleed going to be above or below this arachnoid layer if it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Does someone want to answer that? A lot of hemispherectomy parents out there. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhage, is the blood going to be above or below? Below. Below, yeah, the blood, so you're going to have bleeding here. 
And that's risky because anytime you have blood now underneath, you've also got cerebral spinal fluid, that blood can cause pressure on the brain. And the brain also doesn't like for blood to touch it. And so you may hear a term called um, superficial hemosiderosis or hemosiderin staining. That can sometimes happen when blood cells kind of lie on the brain and it can cause it to deteriorate. And then the PM matter, I think of that like cellophane. It's a layer of cellophane that goes over every single fold and groove of the brain and is protection for it. But it also sits kind of floating in the cerebrospinal fluid. So if you've heard of a multiple subpeal transection, then we know that the surgeon is making cuts below the pia layer, transecting little cuts below this layer. This image is always helpful for me. My son has had some cranial reconstruction. And so when they started talking about removing some layers of skull, it, it was helpful to me to kind of understand where all the different parts play. When we're looking at the dura, remember I said that was sort of the leather-like, very thin layer of brain of tissue that encases the brain. Very difficult. I think it's almost impossible to tear it. Um, it folds down to form a structure called the falx. And this structure separates your left hemisphere from your right hemisphere. It also forms a structure called the tentorium. So here's the two cerebral hemispheres. See how you kind of have some empty space there? That's because the dura folds down and forms a separation in between the two sides. So if you were to open up the skull, each hemisphere sits in its own little compartment made out of the dura, and then under here is where the corpus callosum would go across. Why is this important? There's some old literature that says that in anatomical hemispherectomy, there's a risk of midline shift and the reason that's a risk is because your skull is not empty. And if you have brain tissue pushing up against the dura, that can be risky, that can damage the, the tissue. How do I know that? Unfortunately, my son's brain shift is very significant. After his anatomical hemispherectomy, it shifted three centimeters over. So in his MRI, it shows that this dura is actually, the, the falx is the structure, that's what it's called is bowed because his hemisphere is pushing on it so much. So when they're talking about, sometimes they'll say um, herniation or if there's a risk of herniation or if there's a subtentorial -ten issue, you know that it's below this tentorium here and that the cerebellum sits underneath there. Does anyone have any questions so far? I can look in the chat. All right, I'll keep going. Nothing in the chat for questions, but someone did say, this is so cool in all kinds <laughs> Oh, good, I'm glad. Um, so I already asked this, if you take out a piece of the brain, will it grow back? No, and we're thankful for that because then that would mean our kids would have to go in for reoperation if they did it. Right, so let's go back to this familiar image. I want you to start thinking about the brain, not just as this structure, but I want you to start thinking about it in terms of connections. And this is a beautiful image from an artist whose name is Greg Dunn. And he's actually a friend of the organization and has given us permission to use these slides. And I'm always telling the doctors, can you please use this image when you're talking to parents? Because when we talk about connections, I can't think of another image that shows how intricately, intricately, why can't I say that word? <laughs> how connected the brain is and the different parts are connected to one another. So out here are your neurons. And then here you can see all the axons coming down from the neurons. This image shows about 500,000 neurons in your brain. And here's your cerebellum here. And here's your cerebrum. Does anybody know which structure has more neurons? Is it your cerebrum or does your cerebellum have more neurons? Cerebellum. 
Don't make me start calling on people because some of you look familiar. The cerebellum. Lisa, that's correct. The cerebellum, I believe, has around 69 billion neurons, and the cerebrum has about 16 billion neurons. So you have more neurons in your cerebellum. This here is your nose. So here's your olfactory bulb, and you can see you've got neurons in there that go into your nose. Back here is your occipital lobe. And then some of these axons go all the way down and eventually form your brain stem, which eventually forms your spinal cord. So you have axons coming from your brain, some of which are a meter long because they go all the way down to the base of your spine. When the surgeons talk about your cortex, they're talking about this outer layer here that has all the layers of the neurons in them, the neuron bodies. You have seven layers. When we look at a very basic neuron, you have 45 different types of neurons in your brain. So we're not going to talk about all 45, but this is really what a basic neuron looks like. So one of your motor neurons would look like that. You've got the cell body the axon, it has a, a fatty sheath around it that helps conduct the electricity fa faster. And then the axon terminal here that eventually communicates with the dendrites on another neuron. The direction of information, stay with me here, goes from the body to the axon terminal. It does not go back the other way. So if you're trying to get information out from the body, it goes from the body down to the axon terminal. And this is important to remember when we talk about um, in a later presentation, because I, I decided it's just going to be too complicated to do for this one. When we start talking about how the brain controls the hands and the rest of the body, we have to remember that the messages from the brain are going out. And then you have other messages um, from the spinal cord coming back in, but they're unidirectional. They're not, it's not bidirectional. In, per, in particular, when you're talking about one neuron, it's always going in one way. It helps me to think about a neuron like a balloon, where the body of the balloon is the of the body of the neuron, and then the string is the axon. So when I start thinking about the layer of cortex you've got seven layers, you've really got seven layers of balloons and then the axons down here that are starting to communicate with the body or with the same side of the brain or with the other side of the brain. Now, if we change the color on those neurons, the neurons are your gray matter and the axons, the fibers are your white matter. When anyone's talking to you about gray matter or white matter, gray matter is the cortex, so that's the neurons here. And then the white matter is all, are all these beautiful connections that are coming down. So most of the brain is actually white matter, not gray matter. If you cut the white matter, if you cut the axons, will they grow back or reconnect? Who wants to try that one? If you cut the axons, will they grow back? Will they reconnect? This is a question at one of our conferences. One of the parents said, I think my son's brain has reconnected because his seizures are back. Nobody wants to try. I will call on Heather. I see a couple shaking heads. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be my friend and come on to this webinar. I have to I use my proper him. mouse because I've got my work mouse behind me. No, because... <laughs> I have, I have read this lady named Monica Jones say over and over <laughs> and over that it would be a result of potential missed connections and not reconnections. Yeah. They don't grow back, thank goodness, because our kids will have disconnective procedures. Your central axons, uh, central neurons don't grow back. There's some new research that's saying that you can have hippo hippocampal neuroplasticity. Some neurons can grow back there. In your peripheral neurons, so the neurons from the spine to the body, we're not going to talk about the peripheral nervous system, those can regenerate depending on various situations. But once you cut the axons coming down from the brain, it's cut forever. 
they will not go back, they will not reconnect. And this is just to show you how very complicated the connections are. Um, we're not talking about one-to-one. -one. It looks like each neuron has about 10,000 different connections to other neurons. So we're starting to see how really very complicated it is when we're talking about the brain and its connections. And now you see a layer of cortex, just millions and millions and millions of different connections. And again, if we start cutting here, if we cut here where the axons are, they don't grow back. When you're looking at the cortex, I don't know if we have any cortical dysplasia families out there. Uh, my son, he was born with hemimegalencephaly, which at the end of the day is a massive cortical dysplasia of one side of the brain that in also includes things like thin corpus callosum, polymicrogyria, which is tiny little folds and grooves. So not only were the neurons wrong, but they weren't even folded correctly. You have... Um, I think it's six layers of neurons in, it's called the lamina. So sometimes the surgeons will talk about um, that the, the lamina, the, the, the cells are not located in their proper level. So if you have cortical dysplasia, sometimes a cell that's supposed to be here is up here. My son had something called balloon cells. I don't know if that's familiar to anyone, but some of his cells were just massive. They, they were in the wrong place. They were massive. They say sometimes you can find cells down here. But when we start to look at something like cortical dysplasia, you can see how very tiny the neurons are and how difficult it may be to pick up on MRI. So this is histology. This is a slice that was taken and somebody's looking at it underneath the, the microscope. So here's a little slice of a fold and you can kind of see the different layers here and here's where the white matter axons are. And here's another picture again, just of a, a, a tiny little slice of a fold and here are the seven layers and then here's all the white matter, all the axons coming down. When we're starting to look at the MRIs and their reliability, this is not great news. I just want us to all be very careful and manage our expectations. You have about 50,000 neurons in one square millimeter of your cortex, and it takes 10 square centimeters of cortex to be activated in order for it to record on EEG. So if you have seizures coming from a very small area, less than 10 square centimeters, it's not going to be picked up on a scalp EEG. So if you have a situation where you're being told after an EEG and you're seeing seizures, but the team is saying, yep, nothing on EEG, you ask them, do you, do you think we might have an issue where we don't have enough activation? We don't have a big enough piece of brain that we're seeing because you can have seizures come from a very small area. This is something that I personally find very frustrated that we see a lot in social media groups where parents will say, my kid's having seizures, but I, they had an EEG and we're not seeing anything on the EEG. They told us to go home or they're psychogenic. Be careful because it's entirely possible, especially if you have a history of something like cortical dysplasia that there's a little bit of cortical dysplasia that's causing the seizures, but the EEG can't pick it up. Let's do a little bit of a deeper dive on the connections, because again, I really want you to think about the brain more in terms of its connections, because the different areas that are connected uh, will really resonate with you once you understand how intricate the connections are. We're not going to talk about synaptic connections today. Uh, these are just the points where the neurons are very close to each other. They don't touch, but this is how the electrical messages are communicated across neurons. It's through these ion channels or sodium channels. So if you hear about sodium channel blockers or ion channel blockers, those medications are working at this point. I think in a prior webinar we did with Dr. Marashley at Johns Hopkins, he said, um, you know, some kids have issues with their seizures because the red light, green light, the stop go in these channels is not working properly. And the reason why our kids, so many of them have these serious side effects from medication is because they don't 
the medications knock out all of the messages, so to speak, rather than just one area. And so you'll just get a general decline overall. And, and you know, they're very tired from that. I see there's a question. Um, okay, Heather says it took years and a new neurologist for subclinical activity to be confirmed. Yeah, very frustrating, Heather. I remember that. And synaptic connections are inside within the gray matter. Yes, generally, yes. Um, but the white matter will go down and eventually make a synaptic connection with another neuron, a lower neuron. And there's another question. Are synaptic connections are inside within the gray matter? Yeah, I just answered that. So Sorry. That generally, yes, because yeah. that's where all the connections are. But remember, if that axon comes all the way down through the white matter, it eventually has to connect with another neuron. Um, and then you're going to have a synaptic connection there. Remember, I like to think of neurons as your balloons. Eventually, when the balloons bundle and you're holding that string, you need about a thousand strings, a thousand axons to form a bundle. And eventually those bundles form something called tracts. So sometimes you'll hear people talking about, especially after hemispherectomy, corticospinal tract. That's the tract that comes from the cortex, the brain, down to the spine. This is really important to remember in the context of MRI with DTI especially, because MRI with DTI, um, first of all, it only predicts connections. It does not confirm them. And then it can only see bundled axons or axons that don't cross and axons cross all over the brain. So when you get MRI with DTI, just remember it's not just like all imaging, there's no imaging that's 100% reliable. And when you're looking at MRI with diffusion tensor imaging, be careful because it could be unreliable because it's not seeing all the axons. So now let's look in real life at the axons in your brain. Again, here's your cerebellum. This is a cadaver brain. Up here, you can barely see it, but this is the neuron layer, the gray matter. It's really just very little. It looks like cauliflower to me. So it's helpful when I think about the brain as like two heads of cauliflower. And then the bands that you see, each band is about 1000 axons coming down. Now you can see this big bundle, this big tract that's formed, which will eventually go down to form the spinal cord. You know, just think about opening up the brain and starting to sort of peel open the different layers of brain looking down into it, and you can see all the different connections going back and forth. The connections also go to the same side of the brain, and this is where it starts to get really wild. And so when you talk about something like you've had surgery to the occipital lobe, maybe you've removed this section here, but you've gotten rid of this connection. So it's probably going to have an impact on how the message from the occipital lobe is lost that would have gone to another part of the brain. So sometimes when we talk about visual processing, it's because, or a visual processing problem, for example, it's because these axons, these fibers that are going to another part of the brain have been cut, or maybe the surgeon had to cut this area. Um, the seizure stopped, but now you may start seeing, well, why does my child have a problem with sensation? Well, I didn't touch the sensory cortex, which is here. Well, you did because you cut this connection that goes to the sensory cortex. So again, please start thinking about the brain, not as about just a, a single structure, but about a structure that, of all these different connections. I just let somebody else in. And then here's just another view of connections that are going across, and then some of them are going down. Your biggest connection that um, I think most of us are familiar with is the corpus callosum. So it has about 200 million fibers going across, but you have six other connections that go across as well. And this is why children generally after surgeries where the corpus callosum is cut or totally disconnected, um, they generally have 
I'm not going to say minimal side effects that are functional, but their side effects aren't as significant as we would see if you were to, for, for example, remove the, the whole hemisphere. The corpus callosotomy is generally only good, however, for tonic clonics, the big seizures that are going across, because remember, if you have six other connections also that are going across, then those other seizures will figure out a way to go across as well. Uh, this is for those of you that really want to geek out. So a commissure are fibers that go across from left to right or right to left. Corpus callosum is your biggest commissure, but you have six other commissures. So especially if you're talking to a surgeon about a hemispherotomy or some kind of a disconnect, you want to ask them how they're going to get the other commissures that go across. And if you have seizures come back, you want the imaging to really take a good look at the other commissures because they may say, well, the, the corpus callosum looks great. It's, it's totally disconnected. Yeah, but are the other commissures disconnected as well? Association fibers, those go from one side of the brain to the other. So it might be fiber bundles that tell uh, communicate information, for example, from your occipital lobe up to your parietal, et cetera. And projection fibers, very important when we're talking about hemispheric surgeries, those go down from the brain to the body and they eventually form the spinal cord. I frankly had no idea about until my son's third surgery. So if we're looking at diffusion tensor imaging of these fibers, this is generally what it looks at. And each little string you're seeing there look is about a thousand, a thousand axons. Um, but we're really having a hard time visualizing the ones that cross. And there are a lot of them. It's because DTI isn't very good at that. And here's a 3D image of the brain axons, which I just think is really cool. You don't have to memorize this or anything, but just know that there are a lot of different connections going across. So you might hear it talk about uh, optic radiations. This are from the occipital lobe going to the same side of uh, other parts of the brain. Um, this is a fasciculus going to, um, again, the same side. And then let me see, here's a commissure. So you've got the corpus callosum is up here but you've got another thing called the anterior commissure. So sometimes <clears throat> when we talk about a complete corpus callosotomy, we're also talking about making sure that this commissure is cut. So this is a cool image to use if you start to talk to a surgeon about different disconnections, you wanna ask them where they're going to do that. That's how the brain talks to each other. Now, if we're looking at, now you know the intricate highways of the brain generally. Now let's talk about the neighborhoods. How do these different neighborhoods of the brain, uh, what are they and how do they communicate with one another and what do they do? So again, not gonna talk about the cerebellum too much. Um, but we've got our frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe and occipital lobe. And it's this mirrored on each side. Each side of the brain has these four lobes in it. And the cerebellum is also hemispheric. So you've got left side of the cerebellum and right side of the cerebellum. These are general rules. And one thing we talked about a little bit at this 2019 research meeting we had in kids with epilepsy, with a history of epilepsy, most especially when we're talking about their speech, these rules often go out the door. So even though your speech centers are generally located, for example, in your frontal lobe and your temporal lobe in a, on the left side, primarily with some function on the right, you, they say, you know, we've got kids with speech centers in the back. Dr. Fala once told me I had a kid with his motor strip in the back of the brain. If the brain is forming in a way that isn't normal, you may also have these centers in different speech, in different areas. So especially for those of you who, I mean, my son was three months old when he had his hemis first hemispheric surgery. And we, at that point, we just wanted to stop his seizures. But if you have kids that are talking, if you have kids that are reading, you really want to get down and dirty on all the assessments that they're going to do, like fMRI and WADA test and that kind of thing, transmit transmagnetic stimulation, 
to see if your child's language has um, developed better on the other side or whether it's located in an area that's not typically for speech, for example. So your frontal lobe, voluntary movement, remember that voluntary movement is frontal lobe, expressive language, and then all those things we call executive functioning, like planning, organizing, initiating, self-monitoring, control are generally functions of the frontal lobe. Temporal lobe, this is where your hearing is processed. Information comes in from the ears into the temporal lobe. Um, memory, emotions, and language are also generally processed here. And also part of the visual word form area, which in reading is where your brain recognizes word. Words, part of it is also in the temporal lobe. So if you've got a child who's reading and then needs a temporal lobe surgery, you want to really ask whether there's going to be an effect on reading, um, especially if, if it's left-sided, because most reading is on the left side. Par parietal lobe, I've even had some surgeons say, oh, you know, there, there really isn't much function to the parietal lobe, <laughs> and, and there actually is, so that it, it reads sensory input from the body. Um, body part positioning, so whether your body, where your body is in space, proprioception. I think for children that have had big hemispheric surgeries, this is something we don't really talk about enough. You've removed the part of the brain that's telling them where their body is in space. And I think for many of them, this is one, thanks, spatial awareness. This is one of the things that really affects them when they're trying to learn how to walk. It's hard to do when their sense of space, where are my body parts, are difficult for them to figure out. Um, just an anecdote, but our son really did much better once we put a tight Bennett suit on. It's like a little scuba suit where it just gave him more of a sense of proprioception so that he could figure out where his body was in space. The parietal lobe also has a function in visual processing. So it's not just the occipital lobe back here, but remember those connections that were going all over the place from different parts of the brain? There are a lot of connections that go from the occipital lobe up to the parietal lobe and then down to the temporal lobe. So if your child has had a resection in the parietal lobe, you may see challenges with visual processing. And then sound isn't just processed in the temporal lobe, but also in the parietal lobe. So final sound processing is processed in the parietal lobe. And again, if you had a child with a parietal lobe um, lesion that was removed, they should have an auditory processing assessment because it's possible that their hearing and listening is impacted as well. Um, Monica, there was um, someone messaged me privately, but she'd like me to ask this question. Sure. Prior to surgery, her son had a few words. After, after surgery, he had so many, almost two word sentences, but it's six months later, he lost all of his uh, words, all of his language, and he had a hemispherectomy. Wow. Yeah, I don't know other than I wonder if he's having subclinical seizures that you can't see, but um, are, are doing enough to affect speech. That's what I would look into with that. That's what yeah. I would ask. Yeah, about. she just added that he did develop hydro. So hydrocephalus also, do you want to touch on that and how that could impact this? Yeah, I have I did I deliberately left out hydrocephalus so we can do that in the next round just because it's very complicated but yes, your ventricles if you think of them as water balloons that sit inside the brain and support the brain from above but then also that fluid circulates all the way around the brain. So if you have ventricles that are too big, they're going to push the brain from within and also that fluid will push the brain down it's very possible your son has some sort of brain damage from the hydrocephalus as well. And I'm sorry, hydrocephalus for us has been worse than the surgeries, um, really quite awful, but something to investigate for sure. Um, I, I would make sure to rule out subclinical seizure activity. If we were to kind of open up the brain, we would find, again, remember I said, if you flatten out the brain, it's like a dinner napkin and it'll be folded, 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 folded. There's a fold that, look, there's more cortex down here. So you've got these folds here, you've got all that gray matter here, but you've got another pretty big fold and that's called your insula. 
So it's almost like a little brain inside the bigger part of the brain. And that part of the brain, you don't hear it talked about too much, um, but it's where you feel the sensations coming from your organs. It has some involvement in autonomic control, interoception, um, which is the awareness of your organs. It has some involvement in auditory processing. Your gustatory or your taste is out here, but it's also inside your insula. Um, I think taste, at least for our family, for our son, is something that I wish somebody had talked to about, uh, talk to us about us more, because he is totally incapable of tolerating most foods. I think for him, his gustatory, his sense of taste is so affected that things just don't taste right to him. And while it might not be important for a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, because they're like, look, we want to stop the seizures because the seizures are going to kill your kid. But for us, I get it. It was that we did that. But also the, the lack of, you know, he doesn't want to eat most foods that affects our family. It really limits what we can do. And I just wish we would explore this more. It's something I would like to do um, at one of our conferences is kind of assess these kids and see, you know, is this whole issue with them not being able to tolerate certain flavors or, or really being very particular? Is it related to the fact that we've disconnected um, the insula? Does the insula need to be removed to stop seizures? It depends on whether they're coming from there. It depends on whether they're coming from there. There are some surgeries where you would resect just the insula. So just think about it as just a big fold of the brain that's even deeper. Some surgeons are unwilling to go that deep. Um, I know some will take out the insula in a procedure like a hemispherectomy, and some of them leave it behind. So it's yes, and the insula has two sides. It is part of the cerebrum, Lisa. Thanks for asking, that's a really good question. So when you're talking to a surgeon, let's say you've had seizures come back and they said, well, we did an anatomical hemispherectomy, you would ask, did you also remove the insula? Did you get everything? Because I know several families that have no idea that the surgeon had intentionally left behind either the whole insula or part of it, because this area is now getting really deep into the brain and can kind of put other structures at risk. Um, and it can become a challenge for them. And Heather just adds, the insula really makes me think of my other son who is autistic. Yeah, I'm, I can see how it can it can affect um, that. I have heard the term peri-insula hemispherotomy. Does that mean they spare the insula? That is a really good question. I don't think so, but I will look into that for you. That's a great question. All I want you to gather from this is that we talked about the four different lobes and their functions, but these lobes are broken down into even further areas called Broadman areas. If you really want to do a deep dive, just Google Broadman areas, and you'll see how specialized the different parts of the brain are. So this area 41 and 42, that's your auditory cortex. 17 is your primary visual cortex where the information comes straight in from the eye, eyeballs back into the visual cortex. Truly very complicated. And it's not as easy as just saying your frontal lobe is this function, your parietal lobe is this function. Really everything is broken out. If you're a hemispherectomy family, you're really very interested in this part, the motor cortex. Remember each side has uh, these different pieces in it. And so it's mirrored on the other side. I just wanted to pop in and just do a quick, quick look at the visual cortex. It has three main parts, and this is just one hemisphere's visual cortex. You have two. My son has one. Some people here only have a kid with one hemisphere. Let's see, I went fancy, so now I can't. If you were to flatten, so remember, again, if you flatten out your brain, it's like a napkin. If you flatten out your occipital lobe, how big is it? Can anyone guess? It's about the size of a small pear, about the size of a small pear if you flattened it out. Half of your visual cortex is 
related to what's called your fovea or your central field of vision. We have a whole other webinar on vision, but your fovea is the is your central vision. If you take your thumb out like this and look at your thumbnail, that thumbnail is your entire central vision. Half of your occipital lobe is focused just on that thumbnail area. Why? It's the only part of your vision where you see at 100% acuity. It's the only part of your vision where you can see letters. And it's the only part of your vision where your, your brain will move its eyeballs to get the fovea on something so you see it. If you have a child that's having a lesionectomy or tuberectomy or a occipital lobe resection, you really want to sit down with a surgeon and ask them, I want you to show me on this map what part of the visual cortex you're going to resect. Because if you resect here in the fovea, all of it, your child is going to lose all their central vision and it's going to affect their ability to read or it's really going to be noticeable to them. They're going to see blurry and the other eye is going to take over primarily. It, they're really not going to use this eye much. If the resection is here, this is your side vision, then it's going to be less of an issue. They're really not going to notice it that much. They probably wouldn't notice it at all. But if it's here, again, sit down with them and ask them how much they're taking out so that you know how much vision your child will lose. Okay, we have occipital lobes in the back of the brain. Each side has one occipital lobe. What happens if you remove both occipital lobes? Ken, I'm going to call on you. Blindness, yes. You'd be totally blind. What if you remove both temporal lobes? What would happen to your hearing if you remove both temporal lobes? You'd be totally deaf. Yeah. So important to understand those functions. But again, going back to the connections, because I really wanted you to focus on that, if you remove the occipital lobe or temporal lobe on one side, you've also impacted the connections to the other parts of the brain. I will give you some good news. We had some researchers come test a lot of children that had had hemispheric surgery um, at our conference a few years ago, and their visual processing was much better than the surgeon or than the team thought they would be. So you would think after having half the brain removed that their visual processing would be really severely impacted. And in most of the kids, it was not. So there's something really remarkable about, I don't like to say that the other hemisphere takes over the functions. I think that's kind of uh, overstating it, but the other hemisphere certainly does its best to exploit all the connections that it has to try to, to recover as much of the functions as it, as it can. Let's briefly look at muscle movement. Somebody's asking a question. Probably has a lot to do with the health of remaining brain tissue. I think so, Ken. It also has, it seems to have to do with the age at surgery that the younger the kids were at surgery, there seemed to be better recovery of, again, I don't wanna say recovery, better exploitation of those connections. Let's look really briefly at movement of the muscles. I'm only going to touch on this because I really feel like this is a whole other um, uh, talk. But when we're looking at muscle movement, this is the only part of the brain that's responsible for voluntary muscle movement. That's your motor strip or your primary cortex. But remember, I told you how everything is interconnected your frontal cortex will plan for the movement. Let's say you want to swat a fly. The action of, I'm thinking about swatting that fly and I need to move slowly and I need to look at the fly before I swat it, that planning all starts in your frontal lobe. And then it goes to your premotor cortex. This all happens in you know under a split second. This part of your brain tells your motor cortex to move. Your eyes are seeing the fly, so it goes back here to your visual cortex. You can hear the fly buzzing, so that's helping you locate the fly. 
it's all very complicated. So when we talk about movement, again, remember how very connected everything is. And if your child is having challenges with movement, it might not just be a problem with the primary motor cortex. It might be issues that they're having with other parts of the brain, like with planning or with the vision piece. So when we look at voluntary movement, each hemisphere of the brain has what's called a motor cortex. I think a lot of us call this the motor strip. And that's the only part of the brain where you have intentional movement. What would happen if we removed both motor strips? Would you be able to move your body? Not intentionally, you would not. Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, is primarily a disease of just neurons in the motor strip, just neurons in the motor strip. So when we look at the motor cortex, we look at the motor strip. It's really very thin. I think someone told me it's about as wide as your finger. Most of your motor strip is devoted to the hand. So it's actually has specific areas that are only devoted to each finger and then the hand. And then the rest of the body is generally represented um, in a in a wider in a more narrow area, but the hand. Look at how much function of the motor strip is in the hand. This is why after big hemispheric surgeries, we see such a big impact in the hand, is because so much of the brain's surface area is devoted to the hand. This is how my son's OT described how complex it is to coordinate feeding yourself. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's a very complicated network. If you have ancient hemimegalencephaly or cortical dysplasia in this area, so not only are the connections not right, but the actual neurons are not formed properly, then you're going to have a challenge as well. If we were to look at just the motor strip, then you can see, look at how much is devoted to the hand, a lot devoted to the mouth and the lips. Why do a lot of the kids have trouble chewing after these big surgeries or they have drooling? It's because you've taken out part of the brain, a big part of the brain that controls their mastication, their swallowing. Um, my son can does not chew well. It just is, it's really hard for him. Um, and it, it's kind of a choking risk because he can't chew down to the point where he gets the food small enough. It's because he's missing a motor strip on one side. You also in your parietal lobe have what's called the sensory strip. So the motor strip drives function out. Your sensory strip senses sensation from your body. So similarly, the kids are going to have impacted sensation a lot on their face and their lips that can affect eating and again hand function because the sensory strip might have been removed and then if we just look at this is called a homunculus what would a person look like if their body parts corresponded with their brain look at how much function of the uh, hand is on the brain it's a lot and then the same with the mouth the same with the mouth I'm going to stop here because I'm going to reserve um, motor function for another webinar uh, to give us all enough time to do a deeper dive on that. Oh, and I've got two minutes left. Look at me. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I hope this was helpful. If it was not, or if you have any suggestions for us, please let us know where we always take your feedback very seriously. Don't be embarrassed to say this was terrible. You taught us nothing. Uh, it was very confusing. Your, that We take that information back and we use that. It helps us build better programs for you. You can also drop in the chat a topic that you would like covered. And I just would like to repeat again, in order to be a really good advocate for your child, you cannot be embarrassed to say, I don't understand. Can you please explain that to me again? Uh, just remember that the next time you feel intimidated at a doctor's office, I know it can feel very intimidating. Just keep asking the question until you, until you feel like you have the right answer from them. It looks like Heather has her hand up. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'm going to talk too much, but uh, <laughs> I very specifically for this, I really, really got a lot better of a visual 
of how the seizures can like travel through affect different parts and become generalized in because yeah. I've seen plenty about the brain structure and I took basic anatomy coursework about that but not how the axons actually look and come together that way that visual is really helpful I'm glad in visualizing all that great I'm glad it was it really helped me to stop thinking about it as parts and about connections because then you see how complicated everything is and how interconnected for lack of a better phrase you know what i mean i'm glad it helped you great thanks for coming everybody i know it's such a big part of your day and and we'll try to do a couple more of these in the next few months and always feel free to reach out thank you all for coming <laughs>